the rate of recovery of the two markets, the U.S. market and the European market, uh, was a, a, an important factor in, in moderating the way activists were choosing their investments. Um, you know, the U.S. market roared back much faster than the European market. Uh, and it actually didn't even hit the depths that the, the European uh, market did. And I, I think in some ways that might have, have um, short-circuited a little bit of the opportunity. Uh, but actually, I, I think within the European market, uh, the, some of the drivers of activism uh, move beyond just COVID uh, and, and really come to the fundamental issues of what shareholders are looking for uh, in their investments. I mean, it's a, it's a broad brush comment, but it, it, it's always struck me that the involvement of external activist shareholders has been less welcomed in the European context than it has in the United States or in the UK. I wonder, is that changing at all or are we still con going to continue to see um, activists given a, a tough time by boards and by CEOs and their interests not being welcomed. Yeah, and, and that is still um, a mindset that I think some companies have, but it's very much changing. But actually, I want to go back and, and challenge a bit on, on something you said. You referred to activists as an external threat or an external attack on companies. In fact, in Europe, that's not what activism has been over, especially this past uh, year, the 2020 year to date. Uh, it's flipped on its head. In 2018 and 19, about two thirds of the activist campaigns were led by these full time activists, the, the tier one names that we all know. In 2020, that's flipped over. Uh, the rate of activist campaigns from institutional investors and occasional activists and, and new entrants uh, has gone up by 50% compared to those historical levels. Now those shareholders are representing two thirds of all campaigns and the full-time activists are just a third. For companies, activism is not some external threat anymore. It's something that manifests itself right at home with the shareholder base that you've been communicating in many cases uh, for years. Yeah, Rich, I think you make a very interesting point, and I'm a great believer that all shareholders should be activists. That's the whole point, and you shouldn't let remuneration committees and such just run away with things without actually being activists uh, and engaging. But what about the longevity of holding as well? There is this time-honoured view that activists get in and out, they load up with debt, or they want the companies to load up with debt, and they want immediate returns as now. Are we seeing a, a longer-term holding pattern here, so activists are prepared to hang around a lot longer and act like more traditional investors? Yeah, um, the reality is the holding period for many activists now is uh, two, three, four, even some cases five or seven years. I think that idea of activists themselves as short termists, uh, it, it really kind of misses the mark of what activism is today. And, and I think you hit on it. And in fact, in uh, it, the lead in, as you were talking about situations like Disney, um, this highlights the way that many activist campaigns now are not about levering up and, and returning capital and dividends. In fact, it's challenging the strategy of the business. It's challenging what the management and board are seeking to do. Um, in many cases, encouraging reinvestment in uh, other areas for growth, uh, be it uh, whether it's you know, streaming content or whether it's renewable energy or or you know, technologies that are growing faster than perhaps the historical uh, business units of the company.